This is AP YouthNet. Hello and welcome back to AP YouthNet Talk Show, where we look at some of the key issues relating to youth employment in Asia and the Pacific. I'm Sophie Fisher from the International Labour Organization. In today's programme, we'll be looking at the issue of young people and trade unions. We'll be talking about the challenges and opportunities facing trade unions when they try and organise young workers. We'll hear from some very active young labour groups. And we'll talk about some of the strategies being put forward by trade unions to tackle the jobs crisis facing young people. Joining me in the studio today are Matthew Cognac, the ILO's Youth Employment Specialist for Asia Pacific, and Christine Nathan, the ILO's Workers' Organisation Specialist for Asia and the Pacific. Welcome to you both. And on Skype from Australia, we have with us Josh Peake, City Organiser at the Shop Distributive and Allied Employees Association of South Australia and the Northern Territory. Josh, a welcome to you too. Great to be here. Josh, let me start with you since you are the youngest person on this panel. Trade unions around the world are reporting declines in their membership. It also seems that young workers are not joining unions in the same way that previous generations did. Is this also a phenomenon that you're meeting in Australia? Well, look, I think most certainly um, unions, uh, organising young, young workers is a difficult thing. I think we shouldn't kid ourselves about the difficulties that uh, unions face in organising areas of employment that probably have never really been organised. And, and on top of that, um, the economy is changing. So um, we have a huge development of workers in services sectors that traditionally haven't been organised. Um, and particularly within Australia, um, sure, there has uh, been a big change within our economy as well. Um, but I think all of that is just simply a challenge which unions, I think, are more prepared than ever to face. Um, but I think it is a real challenge, um, particularly with a mobile labour market as as well. Um, particularly in in Australia, there there used to be sort of uh, it, it was quite common that people would have a job for life that you'd end the labour market in a particular workplace and stay there for your entire career. Where certainly now that's not the case. Some um, people may only be in jobs for one, two, or three years, and so that um, means that there's a whole bunch of new challenges that that, that unions face in trying to ensure that um, we keep workplaces organised. Matthew, let me put the same question to you in a slightly different way. Why do you think that young people in Asia Pacific are, are not joining unions? Well, first of all, we are in a situation of crisis. We have 75 million young people unemployed throughout the world. 45% come from Asia and the Pacific. And systematically, they are two to three times more likely to be unemployed than adults. What we realize in this region, as well as in some others, is that systematically the young people will not have the same rights at work as their uh, adult colleagues or counterparts and they need to have a better access and understanding of what these rights are all about and in that sense them joining unions is something that they favor very much there is no question about the willingness or the interest that young people would have to join unions i think the question is a little bit more reversed it's about how can the unions particularly as josh was saying in a in a time of of change change from agriculture to industry to service how can the trade unions reach out to these young people in an easier way how can they, they make better use of the technology uh, that is available and how can also can they promote all of these services that are for many of them intangible services to the young people it is not necessarily an easy thing for a young person to adhere to a union on the on the basis that it will be for intangible services. There is also the whole aspect about information and there is a perception by many that a lot of the information, for example, like I was saying on the right side of work, is something that can be now found independently by Googling or by going on other places on the internet. And so the question is raised, do I really need to have a union to inform me of what this rights are all about? I think we know that the answer is that yes, there are many advantages and many reasons why the unions need to reach out to the young people, but it's in, in in this reaching out that the effort needs still to be consolidated. Okay, Christine, let me just get you to answer one specific question. Is this um, a phenomena of developed economies like Josh's or does it also afflict developing economies? Uh, yes, in the developing countries, it's also a problem 
because most of the jobs created in the developing countries we can see are not full-time jobs. The jobs which are being created are largely in the informal economy. And as Josh from Australia said, that this group of workers are also very mobile, from part-time to casual to almost there's no full-time employment. Now, if you look at why they are not joining unions, yes, it has been, as uh, Matthew has said, they do not know about their rights and their responsibilities. But I would like to say here that these issues or this information you really don't get from internet or the website or from Google because this they really need to go to the national centers in their countries and talk to the trade unionists as to what are the, the what are the reasons that they I mean how they should get organized, what are the methods for organizing, because they have absolutely no knowledge. And here it's more important they feel at this point in time rather have a job than even talk about union membership because there has been cases in many of these areas that there has been an environment where the minute you talk about trade unions there could be a possibility that this part-time or casual worker can lose his job because the environment has to be conducive also for the young workers to know their rights to know their responsibilities and I think at this point in time I would really like to say that there are organizations like the national federations or the global unions or the ITUC, which has now started bringing in youth committees, bringing in youth committees to look at succession planning to take over the, the unions at the later stage. And there has been youth to youth organizing campaigns. There has been youth committees, there's been youth structures, there's been separate budgets for the youth set aside. So there are instances in many of these organizations where they're looking at youth getting into the formal structures of trade unions. Josh, is what we have here a sort of chicken and egg situation whereby young people don't understand that their rights at work are an issue and therefore don't join unions and because they're not in unions they don't appreciate that they have rights at work? I think that's absolutely right. I mean particularly within Australia we have a big uh, problem around secure employment. Um, about 45% of our workforce are in insecure way, casual employment. And for many of these people, the issue that they're thinking about isn't necessarily about which union I should join. It's how do I ensure that I have hours next week and an ongoing income? And they're going to do everything that they possibly can to ensure that they're not going to um, aggravate their employer um, so they lose hours. And that's, I think, more of a challenge for trade unions than for anyone else. Um, it's up to us um, to reach out to these, these people and say, we can assist you. You do have rights around guaranteed hours and about secure employment. Um, and uh, the Australian Council of Trade Unions this year uh, launched a very big campaign around um, secure work and uh, a better future. And I think it's these sorts of campaigns that um, talk about the challenges that young people are facing. I think that's a significant thing that um, whether it's particular unions or federations of labour need to be doing. It's about making sure that the campaigns that we're running are relevant to young people and so that people can, can actually see that um, joining a union is something that uh, is worthwhile and is going to benefit them. So there's something that unions need to do here. They need to change their, their methods of communication, the way they're getting their messages out to young people and perhaps change some of those messages too? Well, I think there's a whole range of things that we need to be doing, but um, it's not that we need to be doing them. We already are doing them. Um, so whether that's uh, engaging with people via social media, um, whether that's uh, working out different ways of contacting workers if they don't feel comfortable um, talking to unions um, at their work site or the work site makes it difficult um, for them to talk to their unions, um, catching up out of hours or at different locations, um, ensuring that we're communicating with uh, material that um, is easy to understand and talks the language of young people. Um, the variety of things that we should be doing and that we are doing is incredibly broad. Um, but I think it all comes down to making sure that um, we are understanding the issues of young workers and that we're seen to be communicating and responding directly to those issues. Christina, I, I want to raise with you another point that Josh made, which was about the changing nature of work. Now, in the heyday of unions, they were centred around factories about big centres of employment. Workers are now more spread out, and as you said, there's much more, many more workers in the informal economy. This must be a huge challenge for union organisers. Do we really call them a worker when they are in the informal economy? You know, how do we address that? Because very often there are disguised form of employment relationships. 
such as such as you say they are self employed but they are not really self employed they're actually producing for someone so for us according to subcontracting subcontract for the contractors so actually if you look at the um, employment relationship which was discussed in 2002 that really said we have to establish who is the worker and who is the contractor and today we call them uh, self employed workers but they're really not self employed they are producing for someone and this is some of the differences and the challenges which we have to establish as organizers establish the contractor establish the worker and establish this employment relationship and just to clarify one technical point there are two ILO fundamental conventions that cover freedom of association the protection of rights to organize and collective bargaining and they are convention 98 on the right to organize and collective bargaining and convention 87 on freedom of association and the protection of rights to organize now workers are covered by those whether or not they are in unions and whether or not they're formal or informal sector is that correct I'm glad that you raised this very very important question Sophie because this is one of the main fights which we are having in our region. First of all the ratification level on these core conventions is very low in Asia Pacific. 87 98 is highly important even if you are looking at rights of work, young workers at the workplace. Now the minute you say 87 there are many countries in our region which has not ratified 87 98 and when we don't ratify 87 we don't have the right to organize most of the countries and they do not let you organize workers in the informal economy and that is where our workers are and especially the young workers so just to clarify that point countries that have not ratified convention 87 unions are not allowed to organize in the informal sector there is a barrier there because the minute we say we are uh, organizing agricultural workers or construction workers in the informal economy like domestic workers we are really not permit not allowed to organize there are big walls put up there Now despite the obstacles to unionizing among young workers there are a number of young active labor groups in this region and let's hear now from two of these groups the first is public services international or psi youth network for asia and the pacific hi this is tan si wei uh, from the asia pacific youth network of Public Services International (PSI). I'm also a young workers representative for the executive board for Asia Pacific region. I want to say that young workers need the trade union, and the trade union need the young workers. And if if we fail to incorporate young workers into the trade union, then the trade union will be missing out on many new ideas and perspectives that young workers can contribute. The trade union needs to change and implement policies that can involve more young workers and also to mainstream young workers. I believe that our network will grow and we will be able to bring new solutions and ideas to the trade union for the coming challenges that the trade union will face. Thank you Tanziwe in Singapore. Now let's hear from an equally active young persons labor group in the Pacific. Bola from the Fiji Islands. My name is Chantal Hazelman and I am a labor rights advocate with Young Labor Fiji. Our aim is to create awareness on labor rights, acceptable work conditions and education on current laws on employment relations. Young Labor are coordinating range of activities such as workshop training sessions with workers and students and having clinics help to set up to respond to queries and issues workers face at their workplace irrespective of them being a union member or not furthermore young labor are also organizing separate sessions with trade unionists and legal practitioners to answer to workers queries in regards to the laws at their workplace we are also promoting awareness on leadership developing in having community speeches and encouraging debates on policy issues in fiji also advocating on various and diverse issues surrounding our current employment relations we as young labor advocates look forward to building with the ILO youth network in the pacific vinaka tanzewe and chantal hazelman thank you very much for your contributions uh, matthew Both those young ladies mentioned the importance of education and awareness raising among young people about their rights to work. Bearing in mind so few young people are in unions, how do we start with that? They're not in unions, so they're not hearing the messages. They're not hearing messages, so they don't see the need to be in the unions. How do we break this vicious circle? What's the best strategy? 
Yes, thank you. Well, um, one of the ways is, for example, to uh, advocacy work at the ILO, uh, doing a lot of trainings and workshops and conferences that deal with exposing the young people with their rights at work. We actually have a manual called Youth Rights at Work that is being adapted and translated into different languages and for many countries that, that serves uh, uh, those young people have access to a better knowledge of what their rights are. Christine, would you agree or do you feel there's too much of a problem of young people just thinking, I'm young, young people are exploited, that's the way it is? It's the female who really don't go to schools or are pulled out at the time of crisis in the family. And this is where also we have to look at social protection for families. Because when families have a crisis on economic crisis or job crisis, the first thing is they do is pull the children out of school. Or the girl out of the workforce and the girl to go out, home. Exactly. So, or it's the first time, the first thing would be the girl is out of school. So I think we have to really combine this with social protection also to cover the young worker. And things like social protection are exactly the sort of things that young people tend not to think about when they're looking for their first job. That's right, and it's absolutely essential, and like Christine was saying, it's very important to actually work for these young girls before they make those choices of life that are irreversible, basically being married, having children, and so on. It's also important to remember that in terms of youth employment, one of the key causes that we have all observed is that young people are not included in the policy discussions. They are not included when we are uh, about to put together a youth implement action plan or a youth implement strategy. It's very important to include them and to hear their voice. Uh, this has actually been uh, heard very strongly at the recent youth implement forum in Geneva and also at the International Labour Conference. Now hearing the voice of the young people is a subject of debate and we are all thinking together about how that voice can be heard even louder. And obviously hearing it through unions is is an essential way. It's important to say that the young people are two to three times more likely to be unemployed, but at the same time, in terms of the union density for young people, it is half than what it is for the adults. In other words, young people's voices are not heard in the ways that they, they could be heard. We've been hearing about the difficulties of young people, particularly in the informal sector, and the difficulties they have in establishing their labour rights and joining unions. Now, this it's important to understand that this isn't just a problem of Asia-Pacific, it's a global problem. And it isn't just a problem of developing countries, you also find it very much in developed economies. So let's hear now from Emmanuel in France, who is seeing similar challenges for his friends and colleagues, young workers in Europe. Donc Emmanuel Zemmour, je suis président de l'UNEF, l'Union Nationale des Étudiants de France, qui est le syndicat euh, étudiant. Et je My name is Emmanuel Zemmour. I am the president of the National Union of French Students. I would like to come back to an issue which I find particularly important, the role of trade unions for youth employment issues. Today, young people are being discriminated against in the labour market. They are finding themselves in a position in which they do not have access to social protection in most countries, including OECD countries. They do not have access to the same rights as others, and worse, they do not have access to the same employment contracts as older workers. In France, for example, the first job is generally temporary and short-term, whereas for equivalent jobs, the majority of the population is hired with permanent contracts. And so we really experience this as an injustice, not just an injustice, but actual discrimination. And workers' organizations need to look into how youth are being treated at work. What can we do so that young people have the same level of social protection as others, despite the fact that they did not contribute to the social security system? What can be done so that young people have the same employment contracts as the rest of society? We cannot accept any more to have internships that are exactly the same as other paid jobs, with the only difference being that they are paid less, less respected and with fewer access to rights. This is one of today's main challenges for youth employment and it needs to be taken into consideration by the trade unions. I would like to end by stressing that these changes will not happen automatically. They will not happen by themselves because young people, especially apprentices, are generally not unionized. People tend to join unions when they already have a job, when they are already more or less in stable employment. Therefore, there is an entire segment of the population, millions of people, who are really not represented today. Unions want to represent them, 
but we will need to find a way to speak for all those without a voice who suffer daily from a lack of security in the labor market, not because they are not as good as others, they are more qualified, they are full of ideas, they carry the energy of the youth, but simply because they are young, and they are being discriminated against solely for that reason. So this is the issue I thought important to raise and on which I would like to hear the panel's views. Thank you. Okay, thanks to Emmanuel in France for that contribution. And Josh, uh, I'd like to like, ask you in Australia, do you agree with him that young people are actually being discriminated against in the employment market? I think um, it's absolutely true. I mean, even in Australia, we have a system of youth wages whereby um, just someone is young, I mean, even those aged 18 to 21, despite being adults for all other pur purposes, are still considered young people when as a result are paid a lower rate, rate of pay. Um, there are many um, sections within the, the employment system that discriminate against young people and it's disheartening for those people to think, well, why should I enter the labour market or participate fully um, if I'm going to be discriminated against for doing so? Matthew, to take a regional perspective, do you think what Emmanuel and Josh are saying is correct? Yes, absolutely. And uh, it, it is just the nature of things. People come on the labor market f to do a job for which they would be less paid because they have less experience, but that they would be able in, in many uh, cases to perform it just as equally as somebody with a little bit more experience or simply with a different age. And so what Emmanuel is pointing at is absolutely essential. And it's, it's the fact that for the same uh, job, you should have the same rights and that systematically you don't have the same rights because you come in on the labor market through different means. And uh, this comes to the issue of, for example, internship programs or apprenticeship programs. We keep saying, and it's absolutely essential, that the young people need to be exposed to the world of work at an early age, because this is what they are critically missing. It is that exposure to, to the world of work. And they do it through apprenticeship programs, which is an excellent way. But at the same time, the rights at work, as uh, they are enforced on the labor market, are not are not enforced in the same ways for those people who come in through apprenticeship programs. And there's a lot of work to be done at that level as well. Christine, what are unions in this region, what can they do? And in fact, what are they doing about these issues such as internships, short-term contracts and so forth? I think both uh, Emmanuel and Josh, what they said, I think this is takes us back to what we said a, a few minutes earlier, that labor laws in a country covers all workers equally whether you're a young worker or whether you're an older worker or whether you're a worker who's worked for 15 years. So this is what we should do the campaign that awareness programs that the minute you're in the enterprise or at the workforce, there is no separate law for young workers and no separate law for older workers. So if they are being discriminated, it's really because the young workers do not know their rights that they have to be treated on equal power with the other workers at the workplace. I'm interested that you've raised the topic of employers being frightened of unions and having a negative attitude towards them because you could turn it completely the other way and look at what they have in common. Young people want interesting work. They want uh, solid work. Employers need new talent, particularly now when uh, the global economy is rather unstable. Isn't the way that unions can actually work to bring these together? Sure. I think this is where social dialogue is very important. And this is where we need to bring all the three partners, like Matthew was saying, whether you're looking at employment policies, you bring all the three partners to the table to discuss employment policies, to discuss what will be the role of interns, to discuss what will be the role of apprentices, to discuss how they will be treated. Because since we are not there discussing this jointly, we are pulling in different directions. And it's also a little bit of a chicken and the egg situation where because you have less of this union density for young people, they are therefore less represented in the unions. And consequently, the unions, if they're, they're 75% or 80% of their members are not young, then they will tend to carry uh, the voice of the youth in, a, in even a, a lesser way. And, and the youth will contribute to say that they are not being represented in a way that they should be and that is the reason why they don't join the unions. So I think that there is a, a great market effort that needs also to be done on the behalf of, of the unions. I think I, I would really like to come in at this point, which Matthew has said rightly. If you see mo several today in the region, the industrial federations have youth committees, 
have youth structures. They're looking at compulsory 2% representation of youth in the executive boards. They're setting aside funds for youth committees to function. They're even looking at youth discussing HIV AIDS or youth discussing gender or youth discussing migration. So there are different areas where the unions have brought the youth in. And I think sooner or later, once they are on the executive, com and they also have campaigns where youth organize youth. So there are different strategies, different structures being thought about now, and how the youth should have not only a voice at the workplace, but youth should also have a voice in the decision making in the unions. Uh, Josh, I, I'd like to ask your opinion on this as well. I, I, Emmanuel, your counterpart in, uh, in France, raised the issue of young people's voices being heard in the formulation of strategy. W would you say that that is handled adequately in, in Australia particularly? Christine mentioned a number of devices such as minimum representation and so forth. Uh, are these the kind of things that you find useful? We do. Um I mean, in some ways, it's a bit of a patchwork quilt. Um, you know, di different unions deal with these things differently. Um, the union that I come come from in South Australia, 65% um, of our members are under the age of 26. So we organise young workers incredibly well, and we do that by using a whole range of strategies. And if I can go back to what Christine said as well, where it's really important to have a dialogue with with employers and to work and and to work towards sim similar goals that's one of the ways that we, that we've made sure that, that that we're within workplaces where young people are working i think that we have extended a lot of goodwill to young workers is we have what's called the young workers legal service which is a free service that's provided um within south australia that says to people in non-unionised workforces, if you have a problem, um, you can access this service as um, a one-only service run by trade unions um, to provide young people with, with some free assistance um, and so that next time uh, they will join their union to ensure that um, things go more smoothly. Unions also need to focus on ensuring that they have a youth policy, um, that they engage young workers within each workplace so they have young work site delegates, um, that we also have youth committees. Um, my union has a national youth committee and I'm also a representative on the uh, national ATU youth committee which I chair. So um, it, it's about ensuring that um, right up to the top of all union le leadership there is uh, the ability for young people to voice their, their opinions, not only about what we can be doing to um, better um, represent young workers and make sure that uh, young worker issues are being recognised, but that also we can better engage with young workers right across the community. That's very interesting. Um, Josh, one of the other things I want to ask you, because we can't leave this discussion without talking about the current economic situation, which everywhere in the world has affected young people more than almost any other group. Do you feel, because young people are quite well integrated into the union structures in Australia, do you feel that your opinions have been taken um, enough into account in the formulation of crisis response policies? I think when we look, look at uh, crisis response and sort of the economy, um, there's been some engagement. Um, we've done lots of things uh, at the young worker level to ensure that uh, when our Congress meets, uh, that young worker issues to front and centre by holding youth-specific congresses that discuss youth employment matters. Um, and it really comes down to making sure that uh, there is constant engagement between the young leadership and the senior leadership, not just within the union movement, but within society. Christine, one of the points, uh, I wanted to pick this point up with you about the economic stimulus packages, because many of them uh, focus on public works and infrastructure and entrepreneurship programs, particularly targeting young people, encouraging young people to get involved in these. Now, uh, from a union perspective, do you think this is correct? From the public partnership programs, like if you see... Uh there are several programs created where they can bring in youth employment in large numbers. For example, as we have in India, which is the uh, NREGA program, which brings in a huge number of young people on this public uh, infrastructure programs. And here, yes, it creates employment, but of course we have to see from the ILO perspective, is this employment decent employment? And for us, it's important as trade unions to see that when we are talking about promoting such uh, labor intensive uh, projects in some countries, whether it really falls under our decent work agenda, which has issues of occupation, safety and health, women's issues, rights at the workplace, discrimination, etc. Matthew, you clearly agree. 
I absolutely agree. And this is where we should be very careful when we talk about numbers and figures, not to forget that having in any given country, let's say a 20% youth unemployment rate, does not really compare to a 50% unemployment rate in a country like, uh, for example, Spain, because there are differences in terms of access to social protection. There are differences in terms of decent work, basically, um, uh, occupational safety and health and the whole range. So we have to be careful that in every public uh, policy or public investment type of program like in uh, India with the NREGA and with some others that there is a focus that it clearly is on the quality of the jobs that is clearly on the fact that not only jobs but decent jobs should be created and the same goes with other instruments that are essential to solving that youth employment problem. I'm thinking of entrepreneurship for example. It's an absolutely essential tool at the condition that entrepreneurship clearly focuses from the very beginning on the creation of jobs that are decent for the young people. You uh, have just come back from the 101st International Labour Conference in Geneva where youth employment was very high on the agenda. What were the participants saying there about the economic stimulus packages and how relevant they were to them? Well, clearly there was this call once again that was made for the public investment test program, for inco income security program, for entrepreneurship for as long as it is linking to uh, decent work, and also a call for enterprise uh, employment creation uh, program. So the, 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 the workers and the employers at this International Labour Conference 101 did not disagree on the, on the range of those for as long as there is clearly always the focus on good quality, decent jobs. The the fact that having a job is better than none is an idea of the past and it is it is clearly uh, been I think agreed by both sides that uh, this was not the way to go we need jobs that are of a decent quality Matthew thank you very much um, Alan that's all we've got time for for this program so I'd like to thank all of you who submitted questions and comments and I'm sorry we didn't have time to use them all um, but please keep them coming we will have future shows and thank you very much to our guests Josh Peake from the Distributed and Allied Employers Association in Australia, Christine Nathan, the ILO's Workers' Organisation Specialist for Asia Pacific, and Matthew Cognac, the ILO's Youth Employment Specialist in this region. And once again, if you have any ideas for subjects you'd like to hear discussed, please drop us a line. You can reach us at www.apyouthnet.ilo.org. Meanwhile, thank you all very much, and I hope you can join us again next time. This has been an AP YouthNet production. 